Richard, Duke of York, had a whirlwind of a life. He went from the son of a traitor to a lute-playing poet to one of the richest men in England to commander in France to a traitor again. He imprisoned the King of England twice and started one of England's most brutal civil wars. The guy was all over the place. Here's what life was like as Richard, Duke of York. The Sun Dog On the morning of February 2nd, 1461, a young Edward, Duke of York, and his army was getting ready to face off against a coalition of Lancastrians and Tudors in the Battle of Mortimer's Cross. Edward's father, Richard, Duke of York, had just been killed in the Battle of Wakefield farther north. But Edward was determined to carry on his father's legacy and claim the English throne for himself. But then something bizarre happened. Three suns appeared to be rising simultaneously in the sky. What kind of strange omen was this? Edward's men were terrified. Their horses bucked and brayed. They thought it was a bad sign, one that meant they'd surely be defeated in battle. Edward saw it differently, though. He convinced his men that it was a sign of the Holy Trinity, that it meant God was on their side. In a way, he was right. Edward and the Yorkists would be victorious in the battle, and Edward himself would go on to become king shortly after, triumphing over Henry VI and finishing what his father had started. The House of York had taken the throne and deposed the House of Lancaster. Edward ended up making his royal seal the Sun in Splendor, a nod to the three sons that rose that day and helped him lead his army to victory. Of course, what Edward and his army saw that day wasn't an act of God. It was a phenomenon known as Parhelion, or the Sun Dog, caused by light refracting off ice crystals in the atmosphere to make it seem like there were three suns rising on the horizon. But they didn't know that. For Edward, it might have also been a sign that his father was watching over him. His father had been defeated only a month and a half earlier. His head put up on a spike in the city of York, topped with a paper crown with the sarcastic words, let York overlook the town of York, written on it. The Lancastrians seemed to have a sense of humor, but it was the Yorkists who'd have the last laugh. In the Footsteps of the Father You can say trying to usurp the throne ran in Richard, Duke of York's family. Richard's father, the Earl of Cambridge, hatched a plot against Henry V to overthrow him and install the Earl of Cambridge's brother-in-law, Edmund Mortimer, on the throne. The so-called Southampton plot failed, probably in part because Mortimer didn't even know his brother-in-law was plotting to overthrow the king, and then when he did, it was Mortimer who went to the king and told him what Cambridge and his co-conspirators were up to. Uh-oh. The plotters were all arrested, and Richard's father was sent to death in August of 1415. Richard was just four years old. Richard's mother had died a few years earlier, which made him an orphan and the son of a traitor. As a result, Richard lost his claims to an inheritance and faded into obscurity. Except, of course, he didn't. We wouldn't be making a video on the guy if he had. Richard got pretty lucky, actually. He ended up as a ward of the state, but back then, this didn't mean going into some shabby orphanage. He grew up in Pontefract Castle in York under the guardianship of a guy named Robert Watterson, who was a loyal constable for King Henry IV through the VI. Richard's time growing up at Pontefract was certainly an interesting one. He was free to roam the castle grounds. Given his later contempt for authority, he was probably a pretty mischievous kid. Maybe he'd play pranks on some of the servants or even on some of the nobles who were constantly coming and going from the castle on official business. At Pontefract, Richard was taught how to use a sword and was prepped to become a noble warrior. There are also stories, though many of them unsubstantiated, that Richard learned to play music and wrote poetry during his upbringing at the castle. We can imagine him sitting under a tree, writing a love poem for the girl he had a crush on from the stable. Hmm, maybe he learned to play the lute and would write love songs for her too. No doubt became well versed in politics during this time. His experiences with the nobles coming and going from the castle must have taught him a lot. And as he became a young adult, he was probably allowed to sit in on certain meetings where elders discussed the machinations of the empire. Richard also got to keep his inheritances and lands despite the sins of his father. When Henry V died in 1422, his son Henry VI was just nine months old. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but a nine-month-old doesn't make for a very competent king. If you were to ask Henry VI in 1422 what his strategy was for invading France, he most likely would just poop his pants and start crying. So regents were installed to make all the decisions until Henry was potty trained. One of those decisions was letting Richard retain his inheritances and even gain some. By the time Richard was 14, he was already one of the richest men in England. When he turned 21, he officially became the Duke of York and was the richest man in England other than the king. 
funding a war in France. Before the War of the Roses, there was another war, one that had been going on for over 100 years. The aptly named Hundred Years War between England and France was in its 99th year when Richard set foot in France as a lieutenant of the English territories that they claimed to have there. Things wouldn't go so well. And what did they call the Hundred Year War back when it was in year 57? They didn't know it was going to be 100 years, so what did they call it? Two years before Richard left for France in 1434, he met with the council in Westminster, particularly the two main guys in charge, the Duke of Bedford and the Duke of Gloucester. Together, they had a brainstorm about how to proceed in France. Henry VI's father, Henry V, had conquered a good deal of the country, including Paris. When his father died in 1422, Henry VI was later crowned King of England and France, the only king in history with both titles. By the time of the meeting in Westminster, though, things were beginning to unravel. The Dukes of Gloucester, Bedford, and York were likely tucked away in a private chamber in Westminster, light streaming through tall Gothic windows as they sat around a table strewn with maps of France. Maybe it was night and there were forests of candles flickering in corners and dripping wax. They were arguing about what their strategy should be, duking it out if you will. You see what I did there? Bedford and Gloucester were brothers and they had a bit of a sibling rivalry going. They couldn't agree on what to do. Their ring-clad fingers were pointing aggressively at different parts of the map. There was probably a lot of huffing and mm-hmm thrown in and animated arguments. Bedford was more inclined towards a militaristic approach, continuing the aggressive policy of Henry V. Gloucester, on the other hand, thought they should enter into peace negotiations with the French. Now, Richard at the time, just 23 years old, played the middleman. He was charismatic and, as we said earlier, he may or may not have been a poet and thus good with words. Together, they agreed to try their hand at the military approach, albeit a tempered one. Two years later, Richard would head to France and dive straight into a series of military campaigns and negotiations. Richard's army in France was basically funded out of his own pocket. As we mentioned before, all those titles and lands pretty much made him the wealthiest guy in England. But as the years drew on, England's grasp on their territories there became weaker and weaker. It didn't help that England's king was a teenager. Henry VI finally took the reins from his council in 1437 when he was just 16 and wasn't making very good decisions. Imagine 16-year-old Henry surrounded by full-grown men with chest hair popping out of their chainmail trying to make sense of advanced military strategy, kind of like a chihuahua trying to understand quantum physics. England's foreign policy understandably suffered in the ensuing years. An exasperated Richard asked the crown again and again to make good on their promises to pay him back, but his pleas seemed to be falling on deaf ears. The early 1440s basically consisted of Richard and his army chasing the French up and down the River Seine, and the French then turning around and chasing Richard back down it. Richard became even more frustrated when in 1443, King Henry gave John Beaufort, first Duke of Somerset, 8,000 men to go fight in southwestern France, men that Richard thought would be pretty useful in his campaign up in Normandy, where he was holded on by a thread. Over the course of the next year, the Duke of Somerset made Richard even angrier. His military decisions messed up Richard's relationships with the French Dukes of Brittany and Alisson, while he was in the middle of trying to forge alliances with them. Somerset's campaign in France that year basically accomplished nothing, and in 1444, he died in Normandy while sitting in his castle looking at an upside-down map of France and wondering why he wasn't achieving the types of victories he wanted. Now, for real, no one's actually sure how he died. But based on his incompetence, that scenario really doesn't seem that far-fetched. When Richard returned to France in 1445, the crown owed him nearly 40,000 pounds, the equivalent of 33 million pounds today. Henry VI also gave Richard's job as Lieutenant of France to the first Duke of Somerset's son, Edmund, the second Duke of Somerset. The Duke of York wasn't pleased. Civil war was brewing. Chaos in the Realm by 1450, Henry VI's poor decision-making in France was starting to make a lot of Englishmen unhappy. I mean, by this point, the war in France was basically lost, and it wasn't just Richard who was owed money from the crown. Hundreds, if not thousands, of soldiers hadn't received their wages. Things soon turned violent on the domestic front. In January, Adam Molins, the Bishop of Chichester and one of Henry VI's right-hand men, met a violent end. He'd been sent to Portsmouth to deal with a pay dispute among the soldiers there. The exact details about what happened next are a bit vague, but it probably went something like this. 
Molins was standing on a soapbox telling all the soldiers in the town square that their pay was going to be reduced and that if they were true patriots, they would be happy with what they were getting. And well, thank you for risking your lives in a foreign country for a war that had been going on for more than 100 years and looked very unlikely that they'd win. The soldiers weren't happy. Abracadabra, they morphed into an angry mob, pulled Molins down from his soapbox and then threw a rope around his neck and hoisted it up over a tree branch until the Bishop of Chichester was the late Bishop of Chichester. Then a few months later, William de la Pole, first Duke of Suffolk, another favorite of Henry VI, was taken out by an angry mob. However, this angry mob got to the Duke of Suffolk at sea. Suffolk had been accused by a lot of people of being an all-around incompetent leader. He had been involved in some unpopular treaties with France, including the Treaty of Tours, which saw England cede a whole bunch of land to the French. Now, while the majority of people in England wanted to see the Duke in prison, Henry took pity on him and sentenced him to five years in exile. But as the Duke's ship was setting sail for Burgundy, where he was going to serve out his exile, it was intercepted by a ship full of sailors from Kent who wanted the Duke to suffer more than just exile. They got their wish. They unceremoniously dragged the first Duke of Suffolk off his ship and onto theirs. Once he was on board, they gave him a mock trial, one that was certainly filled with sarcasm and the men throwing things at the Duke before they eventually beheaded him right there on the deck of the ship. Cade's Rebellion and Richard's Oath of Allegiance A guy named Jack Cade, who took the nicknames the Captain of Kent and John Mortimer, assembled a militia and marched on London. Most of the men in his army were shopkeepers, craftsmen, and unpaid soldiers who'd returned from France with a bone or two to pick with the king. Thinking Kate's militia wouldn't put up much of a fight, King Henry sent a small group of men to negotiate, including a guy named Sir Humphrey Stafford. That didn't go well at all. Kate's army wiped them out, and Kate took Sir Humphrey's fancy clothes for his own and marched into London, donning the knight's own tunic, cloak, and boots. The invasion didn't last long. Cade's militia wasn't very well organized, and after a few days, the city itself turned on the intruders and they were defeated. Cade himself lost his life after being fatally wounded in a skirmish. Cade's rebellion did make things pretty scary for a lot of King Henry's supporters, though. The second Duke of Somerset, Richard's rival, was forced to go hide in the Tower of London and wait for Cade's militia to run out of steam. During all this, Richard was hanging out on his estate in Wales, playing the waiting game. There are rumors that he was secretly supporting Cade and his rebellion, though by doing so, Richard would be aligning himself directly against the king and the Lancastrians, something he wasn't willing to do just yet. But the fact that Cade took on the name Mortimer is a tantalizing clue that the Duke of York was perhaps pulling strings behind the scenes. The name Mortimer had pretty heavy political implications at the time. The Mortimers were an influential noble family with claims to the English throne. Richard had Mortimer lineage on his mother's side. It's not a far reach to think that Richard was sitting in his castles in Wales writing top secret correspondences with Cade. However, there's no evidence that he was. Either Richard was smart and just let the events unfold, or was even smarter and managed to stoke the rebellion without being implicated. Cade's rebellion all but cemented the fact that King Henry and the Lancastrians had fallen out of favor. Richard felt that it was time for a real revolution and tried to assert himself as a reforming force against the corrupt advisors of Henry VI. In 1452, he raised an army with the intention of taking out Somerset and laying his claim as heir to the throne, since Henry didn't have any kids yet. Things fell apart diplomatically, though. He couldn't find the allies he needed to move against the king. Instead, he was made to swear an oath of allegiance to King Henry at St. Paul's Cathedral. St. Paul's Cathedral in the 1400s was an imposing Gothic edifice, one of the most impressive structures in the world at the time. Its massive interior was filled with soaring columns and magnificent stained glass windows depicting Jesus and saints. The sounds would echo with every footstep or chanted prayer reverberating through the space. Given the importance of the occasion, the cathedral was likely to be filled with nobles and clergymen. All the important Lancastrians were there, as were a pretty large segment of London's population who were let in to see the event. The Mad King and His Mad Queen At this point, Henry VI's mental state began to deteriorate. He was never particularly a great king, as we've seen, and now at just 32 years old, he started to really lose it. By August 1453, Henry had gone into a catonic stupor, a bout of delirium, that basically left him in a coma for over a year. Historians think it was caused by schizophrenia, which he may have inherited from his grandfather, Charles VI of France. 
It was around this time that his wife, Queen Margaret of Anjou, really started wearing the pants in a relationship, and she and Richard didn't get along. Henry's marriage to Margaret nine years earlier had made a lot of English nobles angry, Richard included. Margaret was French, and in return for her hand in marriage, Henry had agreed to hand over the territory of Maine to the French, a significant and to many a humiliating concession. It was seen by many Englishmen as a betrayal, essentially giving away hard-won territory for the sake of a marriage. For years, the king and queen were unable to conceive a child, but then in 1453, just before Henry completely lost his marbles, Margaret became pregnant. A lot of people raised their eyebrows to this. I mean, how could Henry have, um, you know, performed given his deteriorating mental health? Some began to suspect that Margaret's child wasn't Henry's, but the Duke of Somerset, who had cozied up quite close to Margaret in the years since he returned from France. In the middle of Henry's catatonic madness, Margaret gave birth to Edward of Lancaster. Henry now had a direct heir regardless of whether the child was actually his or not. I mean, they certainly didn't have DNA tests back then. When Henry lost his marbles, Richard was made protector of the realm. But with the birth of Edward, Richard's claim to the throne and his ambitions of making himself heir were greatly diminished. Queen Margaret became a huge thorn in Richard's side. She was smart, she had the ears of many powerful nobles, and she was dead set on making sure her son became the King of England. In January of 1455, Henry surfaced from his delirium. Still bedridden, Margaret entered his bedchamber and showed him his new son and heir. He was delighted and still pretty crazy. Henry apparently mumbled something about how Edward must have been the son of a ghost, an implicit nod to the fact that he wasn't really Henry's son. Or was it just like the ramblings of a mad king? You know, we may never know for sure. Capturing the King Part 1 the War of the Roses was on. Infuriated, Richard amassed an army with the help of the Earls of Warwick and Salisbury and met the King's forces at St. Albans, about 20 miles north of London. The Yorkists were far more prepared than the Lancastrians and outnumbered the King's army 7,000 to 2,000. A standoff ensued. Each side sent messages to the other, hoping that negotiations could avoid bloodshed. But Richard had become incredibly headstrong. He was entitled to the throne, he thought so he could basically say whatever he wanted to this man king who was probably clueless and still a bit crazy. Richard apparently sent a message over to Henry demanding Somerset's head and the king's immediate surrender. Hours passed. Some historians say that most of the messages intended for the king never even made it into his hands, yet another symbol of how incompetent he was. The king and the Lancastrians figured that the Yorkists would agree on some ceasefire, but to their surprise, they attacked without warning. The streets of St. Albans were narrow, and Richard's troops, led by the Earl of Warwick, filed through a series of unguarded back lanes and gardens and out into the main square, where they took Henry's troops by surprise and routed them. A lot of the Lancastrians didn't even have their helmets on. You gotta keep your helmets on. In the ensuing chaos, the Duke of Somerset was forced to flee into an inn. Besieged, he fought his way valiantly out of the inn stepping over the bodies of fallen Lancastrians, taking out a few Yorkists, before himself finally being cut down. Richard's rival was no more. In the aftermath, Henry VI was captured and ceremoniously carted off to London. Richard needed Henry alive. A dead king would mean that Henry's son Edward would become king. And since he was only two years old, that would mean Margaret of Anjou would become the de facto regent, something Richard really didn't want to happen. Love Day An uneasy peace ensued. The next couple of years were marked by Richard making concessions, Margaret of Anjou throwing dagger eyes at Richard, and Henry basically drooling in his bed on and off. Henry did get up the gumption to declare a ceremonious Love Day. The king hoped the Yorks and Lancasters could kiss and make up, so they all started taking off their clothes, and then, no, 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 I'm good. 15th century England wasn't that progressive. Henry's Love Day was a ceremonial procession from Westminster to St. Paul's Cathedral in London to show everyone how happy the warring factions really were. Margaret of Anjou held hands with Richard, other Lancasters held hands with other Yorks, and they all marched down white and red rose-strewn streets as doves flew above their heads and a rainbow appeared on the horizon. No, that didn't really happen. Henry's hopes that everyone could kiss and make up were, at the end, fruitless. Soon after the event, things descended right back into civil war. Capturing the King, Part 2 On July 10, 1460, Richard, Warwick, Salisbury, and their army had King Henry VI's camp in Northampton surrounded, 
Henry has set up a defensive position just north of Northampton, near the River Neen, with an army that numbered around 5,000 men. The fortifications were pretty formidable and consisted of a series of trenches and stakes that were designed to keep the Yorkist forces at bay. But the Yorkists had an advantage, Lord Grey of Ruthen, who was supposed to be defending the Lancastrian camp. Well, he switched sides and supported the Yorkists during the battle. Taking advantage of Grey's betrayal, the Yorkists wormed their way into the Lancastrian camp. The ensuing battle was swift and brutal. Within just 30 minutes, the Yorkists had breached the defenses and overwhelmed the Lancastrian forces. In the aftermath of the battle, King Henry VI was found by Warwick's men, sitting quietly in his tent, apparently unharmed but also quite detached from the events around him. He might have been delusional or yet in another catatonic state given his history of mental illness. An unresponsive King Henry VI was taken prisoner by the Yorkists and was effectively under the control of Richard and his allies. Richard then made a triumphant return to London. His march into the city was one of power and symbolism. He kept his sword upright before him as he marched into Parliament, a clear message that he was the dominant force in England and that he believed himself to have the right to the throne. Once in Parliament, Richard's actions were even more audacious. He approached the throne and set his hand on it, another bold claim to the crown, especially with Henry VI still alive, albeit a prisoner. When the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was standing near him, asked him whether or not he wanted to go see the king, who was in prison in the Tower of London, Richard reportedly said that, quote, I know of no person in this realm which oweth not to wait on me rather than I of him. Now, if we translate this roundabout medieval phrase, basically he says, I'm so important that everyone should be waiting on me and not the other way around. The reaction from many nobles was pretty negative. While some might have agreed that Henry VI's rule was problematic, they were not necessarily ready to completely overturn the established order in favor of Richard. This act of hubris on Richard's part was a pretty big miscalculation, and it hurt his cause in the short term. Instead of being immediately declared king, as he might have hoped, the Act of Accord was later passed, which made Richard the heir apparent, but kept Henry VI on the throne. Margaret of Anjou was hotter than fish grease about this. The Act of Accord essentially disinherited her son Edward, and with her husband held prisoner and still drooling, she mobilized an even larger army. The War of the Roses was kicking into high gear, but Richard wouldn't be around much longer to see England devolve into an all-out civil war. Richard's downfall came just a few months later at the Battle of Wakefield. He made a fatal miscalculation at Wakefield that resulted in his head displayed on a stake. That's some mistake. But despite his defeat, Richard, Duke of York's legacy, would live on through his sons. Edward IV became the king soon after. King Henry VI, his wife Margaret, and their son Edward fled to Scotland. Now, the War of the Roses raged on for another 25 years, and ultimately, neither the Yorkists nor the Lancastrians came out on top. It was the Tudors who took the throne. But you know what? That's for another video. Hey, thanks for watching. What other English nobles do you want to learn about? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more nutty history.